It is my pleasure now to introduce you Jody McGuire there from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and she will be telling us about the Earhart quasi polynomials of Coxeter permitted here. So go ahead, Jody. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, and thanks, Andres, for going first and uh, giving a lot of uh, intro to what I'm going to be talking about as well. I'll still cover a number of those things, but uh, now you guys all have some basic ideas. So the second time through is always easier to understand things, right? Um, so yes, this is uh, work here based on my master's thesis uh, with uh, Federico Ardila and Matthias Beck, who I've got pictured down with me on the bottom, um, and actually just uh, published in December. So I've got a link to that paper at the end in case you guys uh, want to read more about the uh, couple things I'm able to tell you now. Um, all right, so to start out with, we're going to, here's our nice little recap. Um, we've got a convex polytope. So as Andres was saying, you know, you, uh, throw some points up in your favorite space, put some saran wrap around them. And Andres said that he, people use this, but I think every time I've heard it, it's either been Andres saying that or people citing Andres saying that. Um, uh, but we are, we've got our nice little example here of this uh, uh, square here and then the uh, larger square and another larger square. So these are uh, two-dimensional polytopes. Um, and the discrete volume of these polytopes is the number of points inside of them. So uh, here for this little one, we've got four. Uh, for this next uh, middle one here, we've got 16. And then for the largest one, uh, we've got 36. Um, and speaking of these different size polytopes, um, we're interested in like, we've got this kind of base one starting out here. And then uh, we can dilate our polytope, which is to say multiply uh, every point inside by some uh, positive integer. Um, and so here we've got the third dilate and also the fifth dilate um, of our little unit square. Um, and then lastly, we uh, the lattice point enumerator is going to describe the number of points inside of each dilate. Uh, so for this one here, uh, if I plug in one, I should get four. If I plug in three, I should get 16 and five should give me 36. And if you're looking at this, you might notice, hey, there's a nice little pattern there, which is uh, t plus one squared. Um, so is there a similar pattern for other nice polytopes? Um, and Earhart in 1962 said, yes, there is. In fact, if you have an integral convex d-dimensional polytope, then this lattice point enumerator is a polynomial in t um, and it has a uh, degree D, uh, it has leading term, the volume of P, and it has constant term one. So if I look back at this square again, and we multiply out uh, T plus one squared, we're going to get a polynomial in T of degree two uh, with leading coefficient one, which is the volume of our nice little unit cube there, and constant term one. Um, but Again, just as on the days, we're not interested just in these integral polytopes where we want rational ones. Um, and so if we have, if we, uh, what I'm going to be doing uh, is I'll be shifting my integral polytopes so that their center is at the origin. So we'll do that with the square in just a second. Um, but sometimes you stay integral, sometimes you become not integral anymore. Um, and so if you, if you have an, this uh, integral polytope, and then you shift in, it becomes rational. Um, then we're going to get a quasi polynomial for our lattice point enumerator um, in T of degree D. Um, and then this new thing, the period is going to divide the least common multiple of the denominators of the coordinates of our polytope, uh, which is sometimes uh, referred to as the denominator of the polytope. Uh, so here's our nice little square. Um, and just to comment on the colors uh, in general, because I'm going to be doing the shifting uh, between uh, polytopes that have the origin as a vertex and polytopes that are centered at the origin. Uh, the first are going to be blue and the second type, the one centered at the origin, I've uh, colored purple just to help distinguish those. Um, all right, so for this one, um, now if I look at the first dilate, I've just got one point. Um, now if I look at the second dilate, you can see that it's integral again and it has uh, all nine points that you would expect to see um, from the integral, uh, uh, same as in the integral case. Uh, but then, then the third dilate, we don't add any new points. But then the fourth dilate, we're back up to the full 25 points. 
Um, and so you can kind of see two separate patterns here. Uh, this first pattern, or I guess second pattern with the even dilates matches up with what we saw uh, just for the integral square. And then the odd dilates are something a little bit different. And so this uh, quasi polynomial uh, for this shifted square, uh, well, we have the same, uh, the same thing as the Earhart polynomial for the integral case uh, for the even dilates and then something slightly different for the odd dilates. Um, and so that's kind of going to be what we'll see in these slightly more complicated examples, which come from these root systems. And if you are familiar with root systems, great. Uh, we're going to be using the positive roots uh, as generators for a zonotope. And if you don't know what that is, that's fine as well. Um, these are just the, the reason I say it that way is because these are uh, things that a lot of people are interested in. And then you can build these polytopes that a lot of people are interested in. Um, and my favorite example is uh, B, B2 uh, because it is the most interesting example that is easy to draw. Um, and so let's take a look down at this, what I'm calling the integral permutahedra, um, in this case of B2. And um, so the way that we're kind of forming these, uh, these polytopes here is we're going to take kind of sums of these vectors. So like these two here would give you this parallelogram. Now, if I take the, the vertical one and the horizontal one, put those together, that might give me this square here. Um, now, if I take the vertical one with the one that points downward, that could give me this part here. And I can go through and kind of uh, put together all of these um, vectors in different combinations. And once I put all of them together, um, I've got a nice little tiling of this shape. Um, and this is, so this is kind of how we're forming these. Um, but then the nice thing about this tiling is what we're going to be doing is we're counting integer points inside of these. And so these are all parallelopipeds. And for general dimension, you will get more parallelopipeds. And now if we take half open parallelopipeds, um, we'll have six uh, full dimensional half open parallelopipeds and then four one dimensional parallelopipeds and then one zero dimensional uh, parallelopiped. And those all together give uh, a tiling where there's no overlap. And so if I want to count the integer points inside of uh, this permutahedron, all I need to do is look at each of the individual parallel pipeds, the half open parallel pipeds, and count the points inside of those and add them all up. All right, so these are the shapes we're looking at. Um, but as I said, uh, we don't just necessarily want these nice integral versions. Um, one of the questions that we want to think about is what happens if I shift these um, so that their center is at the origin. And one of the reasons we might want to do that is because uh, this is actually gives another way of looking at these shapes. Um, so I'm going to look at C2 uh, because it's a little easier to demonstrate. Uh, so this vertex up here is 1, 2. And the way that I can get all the rest of the vertices is by taking signed permutations of one, two. So for instance, this one here would be like minus one, two. And you can go through and uh, verify that that works and that, that gives you all uh, the other vertices. Um, and so you can do something similar with type D. So this is like one, zero. Uh, type B is, like I said, one of the interesting ones. So this is like one half, three halves. Um, and then type A, well, you'll normally see it actually like here. So this one maybe doesn't work out quite as well. Um, but this one, um, and type A is also a little bit different because it's uh, lower dimensional. Um, but okay, so we're looking at these um, and you might notice, okay, C and D actually still have integral vertices when I shifted them. Um, and that's actually going to be the case for every dimension of type C and D. They will always be integral when you shift them. Uh, type B here, we can see it has half integral coordinates. And that will actually be the case, again, for every dimension. It will always have half integral coordinates when you shift it. Uh, but then type A is the weird one. Um, because if D is even, it will have half integral coordinates. And if D is odd, then it will stay integral. Uh, so the most interesting cases here are these two uh, 
when A, type A when D is even, and then type B all the time. Um, and then type C and D will still just have this Earhart polynomial uh, that we, um, that, the, that the other uh, non-shifted one has. Um, okay, so let's take a closer look at type B just to see what happens here. Um, so just like the square when I shifted it, uh, if we look at the uh, second dilate and the fourth dilate, um, we can see that these ones uh, once again have integral vertices. So just like the square, uh, we expect that the uh, polynomial for the even dilate should be just the Earhart polynomial for the uh, integral case. Um, and then the half integral one will have something different. And you can see that it definitely will be different uh, because over here in the first dilate, uh, this one's got 12 points and this one uh, in the shifted version only has nine points. And so there is some loss of points when we shift it. So one of our questions will be, well, what happens to those points? Where do they, where do they get lost? Um, but here are the uh, polynomial and quasi polynomial. Um, so here the Earhart polynomial is the 7t squared plus 4t plus 1. Uh, which we again see up here for the even dilates, but then the odd dilates has the 7t squared plus 2t, which is a little bit different. All right, uh, so the uh, Earhart uh, polynomial for the integral case uh, was found, or were found, I guess, because there's four of them in 2015 by Ardila Castillo and Henley. Um, and there's a bunch of notation here I haven't introduced. Uh, if you want to know about, more about it, you can check out our paper or ask me questions at the end. I do have a bunch of extra slides with uh, introducing a bunch of this stuff. Um, but the main thing I want to point out is now when I uh, look at this um, type, uh, just the, uh, the ones that become rational. OK, so if I look at this one, this one has this plus LC of G. The only reason I didn't include that here is because LC is specifically for uh, type C. And so uh, I don't have type C down here, so I don't uh, need to add that in. Um, but otherwise, like this, this right here is the same thing that I'm seeing for the uh, polynomial for the even case, which is what we um, had expected. And then the really interesting thing is that going from the even case to the odd case, the only difference is that we are summing over uh, a different set. Um, so like we're not significantly changing the format of what we're doing. We're just summing over different, uh, what this turns out to be is different uh, parallel pipids. Um, so one way that we can kind of look at this is if I've got these two pictures side by side, uh, the one on the left is the integral case, the one on the right is the shifted one. Um, my, if my question is, okay, where did these lost points go? Well, I've, if I'm, you can see in what I've circled here when it shows up, um, there I've got three half open parallel pipids, the vertical line, the horizontal line, and then the uh, vertex itself. And those ones don't have a pink point on them anymore, but every other half open parallel pipid uh, has the same number of points in the purple shape as it does in the blue shape. Um, and so what that translates to is that uh, we were able to prove that um, when you shift your half open parallel pipids, they're either going to keep all of their integer points or they will lose all of their integer points. Um, so there is no kind of in between like, oh, maybe this one has eight points and it keeps half of them but loses half of them, uh, it actually keeps all of them or loses all of them, which is really nice because then we just have to figure out which parallel pipids to count and which ones to not count. Um, so let's look at this again here. And um, well, so what all this uh, notation that I haven't introduced comes from is the signed graphs. Um, and I'm not going to really tell you much about them, uh, except I will tell you how we use them, uh, which is that these right here um, are kind of what we're, what we're summing over and what we're counting. So 
essentially, the, the number of nodes of these graphs uh, correspond to the dimension that we're working in. So here we're working with a two-dimensional polytope. So all of our graphs have two nodes. And then the number of edges corresponds uh, to the, the dimension of the uh, half-open parallel pipe that we're working with. So uh, these purple ones on the top, um, all have two edges. So these are the two-dimensional uh, parallel pipettes. And you can verify that there are six here. Uh, there are six uh, half-open parallelograms in our uh, decomposition there. And each of them contributes uh, some power of two times t squared. Um, and so this one right here will contribute one t squared. This uh, Each of these are in the middle are all the same. So they'll contribute four copies of t squared. Uh, this one's a little bit interesting um, because it's got a cycle in it. And uh, ones that have the cycle, that's where this uh, PC comes from. And so since this one has one cycle, it's going to contribute a 2t squared. Sorry, do I, uh, I think we're out of time. Could you maybe yep, wrap up? this is my last slide. 30 seconds. OK, perfect. Yep. Um, these ones right here, again, will just contribute uh, one copy of T. These ones also will contribute one copy of T. And this one contributes just the one. And so uh, overall, you might notice that this gives us a 7T squared on the top. These ones overall give us 4T. And then this last one gives us one. And so if you remember, that was the part that we, that was the Earhart polynomial that we saw earlier. And then it turns out that the ones that we toss out are these ones right here. And so that also shows that this, uh, this right here, again, was our 7t squared. And this, these two gave us the 2t, uh, which is what we saw as the Earhart quasi polynomial or the Earhart polynomial for the odd dilates. All right. And thank you very much. Let's thank Jody again for a wonderful talk. So oh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Galen, do you want to? Yeah, I was curious, um, maybe, is there some easy to state property about the root system that tells you exactly when your shifty, shifted polytope loses or does not lose its integer points? Um, not from the root system itself, but like when you look at the signed graphs, um, the so the difference, between these is um, so these all these all come from the uh, Zavslavsky's encoding between the root systems and the um, well and the signed graphs um, and what the the what you need to look at which is I'm not sure if there's a nice explanation for this uh, but we want to look at the graphs that have an their graphs. Uh, where every tree component has an even number of nodes. And so the reason that we toss these three out is, well, here I've got a tree component with just one node. Um, and here, same thing. And here I've got two tree components with just one node. But every other uh, tree, um, which is actually just these two right here, um, they have two nodes. And so that's an even number node. So we get to keep those. So. It's really just looking at the trees. And are these, so, okay, follow-up question. Sorry, Jose, and then I will stop asking follow-up questions <laughs> and let you continue to moderate. Uh, it's so these things are exactly, I'm guessing these are things that are like exactly the signed post sets that like Dick Reiner took and used in his thesis to like prove things about type B root systems. Um, is that true? Is that, what, is that what I should be thinking of these as? I haven't actually seen that uh, okay. work, so I don't know. But Great. that doesn't seem unlikely. Uh, if you got it from if you got it from uh, encoding, then um, I would be surprised if they weren't uh, connected. I guess the reason I'm asking is because um, Jose's advisor, um, uh, so Ahir and then this other guy Mahajan, uh, have this other encoding of signed posets, and I wonder if there's some like other characterization of what it means to have an even number of nodes in that other characterization of a signed poset. That's a great question. I'd love to know the answer. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, is there any 
other question? I have like a very basic thing that I feel like I'm missing. Um, what are the signs doing in terms of like? Yeah, so um, this is, no, I didn't explain this at all. I, I cut that out because this is the part Time, that adds yeah. a, a, like 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, but, maybe you don't answer if it's a really long answer, I guess. Well, but. it's just like, if you think, if you remember the root systems, uh, the way that we're adding in these edges is if we're, if we have um, an edge that is EI plus EJ, then we add in an edge with okay. a minus. And if you have an edge that's EI minus EJ, you add in an edge with a plus. So it keeps track of that. Yeah. Thank you. I have another quick question. So not, not in the rational case, but in the original case, because the type C permutahedron is sort of a nice deformation of the type B, right? You're, you're just stretching in certain directions. Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it, is there any easy way to go from one Earhart polynomial to the other? Um, um, yeah, so what you'll have is, um, so yes, the main difference for type C is we have this, uh, LC of G. Um, and where that kind of comes from is that in, in, in type C, you have kind of two EI, whereas in type B, we just have EI. And so this kind of also is hidden in the, in the graphs, uh, for EI, what we do is we add in a half edge, but then for two EI, what we do is we add in a loop with a minus sign on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so kind of the only difference is that type B has these uh, parts that have all these half edges and then type C has has loops instead. And so there's just this extra factor of two, uh, which kind of keeps track of the uh, loops that we have in. Good, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're out of time. So let's thank Jody again for a wonderful talk.